Can the brain and the central nervous system regenerate cells and tissue? That's the topic of our next two videos, neuroplasticity. We get a lot of questions about hyperbaric oxygen or other modalities that we utilize and how they affect brain function, brain healing, reducing brain inflammation, stimulating brain regeneration. Are these possible? And the answer is yes. And so today we're going to talk about the process of neuroplasticity and how hyperbaric oxygen and other modalities improve the neuroplastic response and the ability for the brain and central nervous system to reduce inflammation, heal, and regenerate. So the first question is, what is neuroplasticity? What is this process that the brain is able to go through? And so neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain and the nervous system to create new connections. Those connections are called synapses. Synapses are the ability of one length of a neuron to connect and communicate with the next length of a neuron. That's how we transmit information from one area of our body to the other area of our body. Our quality of life is directly related to our quality of our synapses, our connections, because those synapses and those connections are our ability to understand and evaluate what's going on inside our exterior environment of our body, for those signals to come in, to be interpreted, and then for messages to be sent back to the brain and from the brain back to the body about what changes we're being exposed to, what requirements we have for adapting to these changes, and then producing a healthy and appropriate response to that changing environment. The healthier our connections are, the healthier our synapses are, the more appropriate that communication will be, which will lead to a healthier and more appropriate response from our body to those environmental changes. And so absolutely, our quality of life, our ability to understand an ever-changing environment, and for our body to thrive in that change requires healthy communication between our cells. And our neuronal connections, these synapses, play a huge role in that process. And so for many, many years, the central nervous system and the brain were thought to not be able to heal or regenerate. If there were any damage that was done to that tissue, that damage was permanent and we just needed to learn to deal with that. Certainly, over the last handful of years, there's a ton of research to support the fact that the central nervous system can heal, it can regenerate. We can produce central nervous system stem cells, which can now trigger you know, new growth and new connections within that brain and central nervous system tissue. And hyperbaric oxygen plays a critical role in that entire process. Let's talk about how. I hope you find the content of this channel really helpful either for yourself, for your clinic, or for a loved one. Please don't forget to share it with somebody if you think it might help them. It's our mission to get as much of this information out into the public as possible to make sure that everybody has access to hyperbaric oxygen who needs it. Please hit the subscribe button. Please make sure you hit the like button. And absolutely, feel free to ask questions. Those are the questions that I'm often answering uh, when I do these sessions. So whether we're talking about chronic illness like neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, MS, dementia, Parkinson's, or we're talking about acute traumatic events, stroke, TBI, and concussion. In all of these cases, one of the underlying themes within this is hypoxia, a low oxygen environment. Because the brain is so metabolically active, it requires a tremendous amount of oxygen in order to produce the energy required for normal function. Anytime there's lower than normal oxygen levels available, relative hypoxia, the body can go into a state of dormancy. Anytime there's a shift in the oxygen levels going to the brain, because it's so metabolically active, the body will automatically start to downregulate function in that area primarily to save the tissue. In other words, if there was a lower than normal level of oxygen reaching those brain cells, and those brain cells require high oxygen levels for function, they can't run on empty. And so rather than you know that cell dying, the first step of that is dormancy. And the brain will downregulate the function in that area to allow for a lower level of function or perhaps pausing function, but without cell death. And as that process happens, we start to get changes in, obviously, the communication of the brain, that area of the brain, the body with the brain, and the brain sending messages back to the body. Those changes in communication will ultimately lead to the inability of proper signaling back and forth. One of the most important things we can do with most of these conditions is to reestablish a healthy level of oxygen 
which usually means to reestablish a healthy concentration gradient of oxygen, meaning if we can increase the pressure of oxygen inside of our body, we can drive higher percentages of oxygen into all the areas that need it. If there's an area of the brain that is ultimately becoming hypoxic for various reasons, whether that's damage to the capillary system or inflammation blocking the diffusion of oxygen across a membrane or the downregulation of the activity of that cell, by driving up the pressure of oxygen, we can drive more oxygen into those cells. As those cells start to pull that oxygen in and those mitochondria start using that oxygen back for aerobic respiration for the ability of that cell to make the energy it needs to function properly, all of a sudden we can reboot those systems and start waking those systems up. That would be step one. Step two would be once we have the energy and the systems are rebooted and we're starting to create that same level of ATP required for that function, the body may start to see that the connections between neighboring neuron cells are failing or damaged. And as a result, we want to create new synapses. And that process of creating new synapses is neuroplasticity. So we have to carry information from point A to point B, and here's the highway that it has to take. And if there's damage in one of those roads, we need to, we need to create you know, a detour. And if we can create a detour and a new highway for that information to follow, we can now get those signals from point A to point B again. And that is the process of neuroplasticity. Hyperbaric oxygen immediately will start upregulating oxygen to the cell, which will start getting more ATP production, but longer term will actually help stimulate neurogenesis, literally the healing and regeneration of nerve cells, mitogenesis, the healing and regeneration of mitochondria, and the increased density of mitochondria so that we have more mitochondria to produce even more energy. We also know that as a result of hyperbaric oxygen, we can get up to an eight times increase in central nervous system stem cells, meaning here's an influx of new central nervous system cells that can move into an area of trauma, a damage, or illness and start to repair and regenerate the tissue in that area. And so there's multiple ways that hyperbaric actually affects the neuroplasticity process. Lastly, for here, I want to bring up a specific study, one that relates to stroke and the effect that hyperbaric oxygen has on stroke recovery. You see, in our office, we do see a lot of patients recovering from their stroke. The unfortunate thing is that once a patient is stabilized and either the bleed is definitively stable or whatever was blocking blood flow, the ischemic event, is cleared, hyperbaric should literally be one of the first lines of defense in the recovery and repair process post-stroke. But of course, right now it's not. And so most patients, by the time they find hyperbaric oxygen, it's because they've already gone through their traditional route of PT and OT. You know, they've gotten certain functions back, but other issues either remain unchanged or they're not healing as quickly as they wish that they would or could. And so after months of traditional therapy and rehab, they start looking for, hey, what other things could I consider for the recovery post-stroke? And sure enough, hyperbaric oxygen does show up because it is one of those things that's very powerful in the process. But by the time we see these patients, it's usually at least a year after, sometimes it's 18 months after, sometimes it's two or three years after. The longest post-stroke patient we've ever treated was 10 years post-stroke. Now, we saw great improvements in that person, but I will always tell you that anytime you're dealing with a really any injury or any type of trauma that we're trying to heal from, the sooner you can get into the therapy, the more likely we're going to have a better outcome or closer to a full recovery. This was a study. There were 74 individuals. They had a control group that got no treatment. And then they had their treatment group, which was 40, 90 minute sessions, five days a week. They measured progress, you know, baseline and then post the, the full treatment protocol. And then the control group was ultimately a crossover group. And so after the control group went through a few months of no treatment, and obviously with no treatment, there was no changes or improvement. They were then crossed over into the treatment group and given the same treatment that the initial therapy group uh, received, which was the same two atmospheres, 40, 90 minute sessions, five days a week. And across the board, there were significant increases in cognitive function as well as physical function as a result of those 90 minute sessions. Now, it's also important to note that what they were looking for was late neuroplasticity. In order to be even included in the study, the stroke had to be anywhere between at least six months post 
uh, or up to 36 months post, so up to three years post. And they were looking at cognition, they were looking at physical ability, and they were also looking at spec scans. And so spec scans are going to look at the metabolism of brain function. And so we can identify areas of the brain that are literally dormant because they're not metabolizing glucose at all for, for uh, ATP production, which means that that area is literally shut down. A great test to understand does hyperbaric affect these areas of the brain would see, can we restore normal brain metabolism as a result of the therapy? And sure enough, both in the treatment group and then once the initial control group was crossed over into a treatment group, every single one of those patients saw improvements in their spec scans. Without doubt, hyperbaric does not only induce neuroplasticity in an acute situation, it also has the capacity to wake up dormant tissue and start healing and regenerating brain and central nervous system cells, even at least up to three years post-stroke. What I could tell you from clinical experiences, like I said earlier, we've seen that even later than three years post. And so we know that this is a very powerful therapy for these folks. In our next video, we're going to talk a little bit more about neuroplasticity and then specifically how neuroplasticity affects other not only acute traumatic like stroke or TBI type conditions, but also the neurodegenerative conditions, the Parkinson's, the dementia, the Alzheimer's, the MS. How can we create neuroplasticity in these chronic neurodegenerative conditions? And ultimately, what does it take to create that environment? Not just hyperbaric oxygen, but what other tools can we be using to help significantly alter brain metabolism to wake up dormant tissues? and to regenerate and heal tissues that were either traumatically damaged or are chronically malfunctioning due to disease. We'll see you next time on the next video.